for tuning in to Stay Sharp with Razor Leaf, your secret weapon for all things digital and products and manufacturing. In this episode, we continue into part two of our enlightening conversation with Jeff Gleason, who spent 33 years in production at Lockheed Martin before retiring and founding his own consulting company called DMEC. Jeff unpacks some technology and process challenges that he experienced at Lockheed when it came to digital transformation and applying model-based strategies. Let's listen in to hear his take on some of the biggest challenges that he had to lead his team through when embracing digital transformation in a manufacturing organization. Welcome back, everyone, to Stay Sharp, a podcast about all things digital related to products and manufacturing. And today I am joined by my co-host, Jonathan Scott. Hi, everybody. And Jeff Gleason. Morning. There have been a lot of discussion lately about the value of going model-based. And today we're going to talk about some of the challenges, like if it's so valuable, why, why aren't people doing it more quickly? Why aren't they moving forward? Um, Jeff is bringing a lot of experience, real-world experience, after uh, 30 years, more than 30 years, actually, at Lockheed Martin. Um, Jeff, can you share a bit about yourself and your experience with our listeners? Uh, sure, just briefly. Um, first of all, I should say that uh, you know my entire career of 32, almost 33 years at Lockheed Martin, I was in the production organization, uh, which may be a little unusual um, for your guests on this podcast. I, I did not come up through engineering design, not through IT, but rather production operations. Uh, and I was a practitioner of our business processes. Uh, and alternately, uh, I would spend other portions of my career as an innovator, improving upon those processes through IT tools. And you're right, that is very different. A lot of our guests are either engineering or IT. And what I found fascinating about your background is that you were in the area, an area that was getting things done, right? You needed processes to be working. You needed to optimize them to make them more efficient, et cetera. So you bring kind of a more of an umbrella understanding than anybody than others might in a particular department. Well, and bringing that uh, that sort of variety of perspective, I think, was great. I mean, you know, uh, I don't know if our listeners know this. We had an earlier episode with you, Jeff. It was great talking about some of the challenges organizationally and with people um, related to getting to MBE and that sort of thing. And it was very reassuring for me to hear that the challenges that we see on the engineering side, on the IT side, that they resonated, right? That you see some of the same ones. So it's good to have that other perspective and I'm hoping today we can dig into some other angles on that, on this challenge of MBE, um, but that that you likewise can bring that perspective of, you know, what what you've seen from your side. So I'm excited about this. Yeah, and it's, that's a good point. So I, sh- I should uh, refer back to the fact that this is a second of two podcasts. Um, we, we started by talking about, we had started actually with a long list of things we we're going to talk about, and then uh, focused primarily on the most important piece, which was or the most challenging piece, I guess, which was the people. People, process, and technology. People was the uh, was one of the biggest stumbling blocks. But today we're back to talk a little bit more about some of the technology and process challenges. So, Jeff, I don't know if you want to jump in with anything or if we want to talk about the you know integration between business platforms, interoperability between tools. What, what are some of the big technology challenges you see for enterprises trying to move to model base. Yeah. Well, one that we didn't talk about last time is neither people process nor tool. Um, I guess if I had to put a handle on it, I would say, um, you know, one of the big challenges is, is what is your enterprise's legacy that brought to brought you to your current state? And I can tell you, just speaking from my own experience, um, you know, I I worked uh, at Lockheed Martin in the aerospace and defense industry, right? And uh, I was in production. And uh, it is true not only of Lockheed Martin, but really of every big defense company today that they are an amalgamation of past mergers and acquisitions. Uh, you know, there was a lot of consolidation in the defense industry over the last 30 years or so. And so 
any given large uh, defense contractor today, uh, certainly Lockheed Martin, you know, the same would be true of RTX, you know, they are now um, made up of many different companies from the past that had many different legacies. Uh, they use a lot of different tool sets with a lot of different mm -hmm. formatted legacy data, a lot of different processes to make a lot of different legacy products. Because in this defense industry, the, you know, unlike, you know, uh, if you're designing, you know, home appliances or even automobiles, uh, the platforms that we deliver, like in my case at my company, fighter jets, or even, you know, tactical aircraft of any kind, cargo, cargo planes, fighter jets, uh, their life cycles are measured in decades, many decades. Um, right. You know, the, the, the C-130 cargo aircraft at Lockheed Martin is still in production and has been in continuous production for over 60 years. I started my career uh, in the mid 80s or 87, what do you want to call that mid or late 80s, uh, on the F-16 program. Uh, it was already more than 10 years old by the time I joined. You know, the, the, the Joint Strike Fighter, the F-35, that is the mainstay of Lockheed Martin today, um, is now 20 years old, and it's going to be in service and production for decades into the future. You know, so uh, that, that saddles the organization with lots and lots of legacy applications, legacy data, um, and obligations to use all that stuff. So now you take an enterprise like that and you say, okay, we're going to digitally transform and uh, we're going to become a model-based enterprise. Good luck with that. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm saying it, that you're gonna, have, you're gonna have a foot in the past and a foot in the future for a long time to come um, because of all the complexities I, I just mentioned, okay? You're, if you think that uh, you're going to retrofit the product definition data for a platform that you've been producing that was designed decades ago, began production decades ago, and you're going to upfit it for the model-based enterprise, uh, no board of directors is going to want to fund that because there's, there's simply not a compelling business case for it. You know, the, the effort would be so enormous that you just would not re receive a return on that investment. Now, with clean sheet programs going forward... I, I think that's a great point, Jeff. I, I was just going to jump in on that one because I think it's a great point about, you know, all these challenges we talk about related to model-based enterprise, that a business case is important anytime you're talking about making a change, going through an effort, doing a project, you know, any of that stuff... And you have to be clear about what that business case is. And in some cases, it doesn't fly, yeah, right? It's, it's not like worth it's, it. It sounds like a good idea. And to your point, this is why, you know, you, oh, we're going to transform the entire organization to be a model-based enterprise. No, it doesn't make <laughs> sense, right? If I'm making five of that widget a year and I've got this great paper-based process and I, I go through it, but I get a reliable part out of the other side, but I only do it five times a year, you know, should I go spend a quarter million dollars to turn that to be a model? No. Why would you, right? And, and that's not to say that model-based methods won't find their way onto legacy programs, but it may be, you know, even within a legacy program, you occasionally have what are close to clean sheet opportunities, like a major engineering change proposal where, you know, you, you may be able to carve it out and treat it as its own program to a large extent and implement model-based methods on that. I, I, I know, you know, I mentioned that I started my career uh, on the F-16 program. Well, I can remember, you know, as an NC programmer and then again as a, as a tool design supervisor, um, I received as inputs to my job uh, product data that was in uh, old fashioned, you know, on, on vellum you know, that you'd have to get a blueprint mm -hmm. from, uh, as well as on a two, we called a two and a half, we called it a two and a half D system. It wasn't, it was more than 2D, but not 3D. CADM, you may re remember it. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Uh, so those were, okay, so those were computer-aided design drawings, but they were 2.5D. And, and we also had 3D inputs. Uh, it was like Katia version 2 or 3. Now, they were just lofting lines. You know, there was no PDM. They were just all in a file management system out that you really had to know what you were doing. Right. To navigate to the right lofting lines to take your section cuts, to make a flange angle. So we had, I received inputs to do my job in a variety of, of data formats, right? From very old fashioned to what was state of the art at that time. You know, that's going to be the case forever, basically. So on a, on a program, uh, say today, like the F-35, which started at a much more technologically advanced position, you know, it, it had 3D CAD solids from the start. It wasn't model-based definition, but it was 3D CAD solids. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I believe uh, that, you know, in the future we'll probably see that they'll, they'll break in model-based definition on the F-35 program at some point where it's doable, where it's conceivable, where you can carve out a chunk of work so that beginning at the headwaters of the digital thread, to mix metaphors, um, you're digital from the start and you, you stay digital all the way through uh, production, procurement, uh, sustainment, and that'll live, and that'll coexist with data in the older formats. You know, we saw it on past programs. I think we'll see it on future programs. But I think that's also going to, you know, limit the impact of model-based methods to be hybrid. I think where you're going to see the biggest impact is on brand new clean sheet programs that that have no legacy baggage, no legacy data, no legacy tools, no legacy processes. Um, you, you've got an opportunity to start with a clean sheet uh, that's where uh, you'll see the biggest impact from uh, model-based processes. So I want to I want to I want to add some context there, Jeff, because I think I hear what you're saying, and I just want to make sure our listeners are 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 hearing this right, right? Because what you're getting at, like you said, this isn't exactly process, and it's not exactly tool. It's but it's related to both. It, the point being, you know, when you're thinking about model-based enterprise and some of the challenges you're going to face. Let's say you go sort out the process and the tool in a clean sheet program. Well, that didn't change your whole enterprise to being model-based. It did for that program, but not overall. So there's this time element of that process and tool thing that you have to think about. How am I going to you know, transition this in, this, this new way of working, um, these new capabilities, new tools, formats, all that stuff? How do you put it in place while working alongside old methods and the old programs, old projects, products, whatever you want to call it in your industry, um, what do you do about those? Do you transition them? Are there some you transition, others you don't? And it comes back to that business case point you made. But I just want to give that context of, we are talking about process and tools. We're just talking about sort of the time element of it and how it happens, right? I mean, that's what you're getting at, yeah? Yeah, and, and again, th- this is where... Uh, you know, my background as a production guy um, colors my view on this matter, right? Because I've always been in a position where I'm serving multiple different uh, programs or platforms, uh, whatever you want to call them. For example, you know, from my seat as a NC programmer or tool designer or running a process planning organization, I, I received inputs from, you know, the F-111 program, believe it or not, F-16, uh, you know, F-22, A-12, uh, C-130. Uh, and they all came, uh, all those inputs came from different um, engineering product data definition uh, systems, but we, we ran them all through our same production systems, okay? Uh, whether it was for NC programming or for tool design or for manufacturing execution on the shop floor, uh, we did not distinguish. We didn't have one MES for F-16 and a different MES for F-22. No, they, they all run through the same factory uh, and they're, they're going to be uh, accessed through the same manufacturing execution system. 
Now, that's an interesting point, Jeff. I mean, that, that feels like that presents a huge challenge when you think about that, right? Is how do you make a, a technology evolution step if you can't count on a consistent input or necessarily define that interface? Or may, maybe you can. Maybe that's what you have to do is define that interface. But talk a little bit about that challenge. Well, so typically, um, let, let's, take, let's take process planning as an example. Um, you're... Your process planners uh, are typically going to be organized by program, uh, which helps to address that problem. So it, it may be that on program A, um, they're receiving uh, product definition data from, uh, from one particular system in one format, and on program B, they're receiving it from a different um, engineering tool in a different format. Well, they've got their own dedicated process planners that learn to navigate their way around in that system and uh, produce the work products they need to make in our own system, you know, whether that's MBOM, routings, work instructions, visual aids, whatever it may be, NC programs. Um, so they get good at it. And, they get, and, and if they do transfer programs, you know, from program A to program B, which does happen occasionally, but it's not every day, yeah, there's a learning curve, and they have to they have to learn uh, to navigate some new systems. But generally, for long stretches of time, a given a given person will only service uh, uh, one particular program. In that sense, where it's different is if you're on the shop floor. If you're an operator on the shop floor in a, a fabrication setting, or some some call it a back shop setting. And I want to distinguish uh, between that and, say, a major assembly line. Uh, because in, in, a, in a back shop or fabrication setting, you're producing piece parts, components for a variety of different programs, typically. You know, if you, if you work in the tube shop, this shop order may be to produce some tubes for the F-22 program. The very next shop order may be something for F-35. The next shop order may be for something for F-16. Etc. Whereas if you're out on the F-35 main assembly line, well, the, the only planes coming down that line are F-35s. <laughs> you don't, you don't right. have to worry about, well, I know I'm working on an F-35 now, but the next ship coming down the line is an F-16. No, we don't, we don't have that. They're talking about that. You know, there's, there's a lot of talk mm-hmm. about, you know, flexible factories that can produce anything, but we don't have them yet. Okay. So it's a case of I'll believe it when I see it. Really, in your role, you were the integration point. Production is the integration point. Yeah, you had you had all these threads, digital and otherwise, all these threads funneled together and come through one operations organization. And uh, it, you know, if you're at a given plant, they come through that your your one plant. Um, so you've got to make them all work, and that presents challenges, like, particularly now that we're on this model-based uh, enterprise journey. Um, process planning is a very interesting case. So when I say process planning, in my, you know, everybody's got slightly different definitions. I'm talking about doing your EBOM to MBOM conversion, creating your routings. Uh, for the uninitiated, I describe a routing as kind of the, the uh, the bus route or the bus schedule, you know, I got to go to this work center. After that, I go to this, you know, I go from the saw shed to the machine shop, to deburr, to heat treat, to passivate. That's your list of uh, the work you got to do. That's your routing. And the manufacturing work instructions, which tell operators in detail through text and some visual aids, maybe, okay, here's what you're doing at your work center. These are your work instructions. And it will include things like data collections and inspections and so forth. Um, that process planning has to be done in all cases, you know, uh, on legacy programs and new model-based programs. Where you do it uh, may change, right? So the current thinking is that uh, EBOM to MBOM transformation should be done in the PLM. Uh, and and I'm, I'm an adherent to that point of view. Uh, I, th- I think you know, maintaining a very tight association between your EBOM and your MBOM uh, obviously facilitates propagation of BOM changes. 
and bomb reconciliation, which is bomb reconciliation, particularly uh, at the end of the line when you get ready to deliver an aircraft. It's just enormous. I can't overemphasize how enormously important that is to be able to tell the customer, look, we've done an accounting. Everything that was supposed to be in there is in there in the right configuration. Nothing extra, nothing missing. It's all the right parts, the right version, you know, the right dash number. Uh, so to do all that in your PLM, um, and, and most PLMs, most, most modern full-featured PLMs are good at it too, which is important. So that's good to do there. Uh, routings are not too hard to do. Um, I'm going to say most of your full-featured PLMs can do that now. The detailed manufacturing work instructions are another story. Um, your, your major PLMs now, some of them are better than that at others. Some of them don't even make a claim to try to do that, okay? But you've got to have work instructions on every program, okay? So if the thinking is, well, we want to move process planning to PLM, okay, which PLM or, hearkening back to earlier in our conversation, which plural PLMs are you using and how good as how good is it at process planning That'll determine whether you can really use it for process planning for that program. And if you can't use your PLM for process planning, what are you going to use? Some MESs come equipped with built-in process planning and some don't. Uh, if you've got one that, that does come equipped with process planning functionality and it's good solid functionality, problem solved, but if your MES and, and a lot of MESs do not come with built-in process planning. Well, then what are you going to use? If you've decided, well, I can't rely on that PLM, uh, but my MES doesn't do it, uh, now you've got a problem of going out and seeking yet another system to integrate for process planning. So now we're digging in, Jeff, to that, to that tool issue, right? I mean... We were we were in the talking about the time element of it a few minutes ago, but you're hitting right at the core of this: what tool to do what function in your process, right? And that's a tricky thing. Yeah. And so, I mean, you you can imagine again um, a hybrid situation. For, for, if you've got a vast enterprise that is an amalgamation of, of a lot of different mergers and acquisitions, you've got a lot of different uh, product definition data threads funneling into one operations organization, um, you can imagine that um, you'll be doing some of your process planning in PLMs for some programs at the same time you're doing process planning for other programs, perhaps older, more you know, legacy programs, uh, doing the process planning in your MES. Um, you know, there are all those, all of, in all cases, you're producing shop orders that are flowing through you know, you know, a given factory, particularly if it's a, a back shop operation, like I was saying, um, you're going to get shop orders one after another for different programs where the product definition data came in different forms. Work instructions for one uh, on one shop order, maybe model based work instructions, and on the very next uh, shop order, it might be for an older legacy program where you have little to no graphics, certainly no interactive 3D graphics, not model-based. Um, you know, you're going to see a variety of stuff flowing through the same shop because you don't have the luxury of recapitalizing um, your production for every new program. It's going to have to run through existing factories. And we should, and I was going to say, we should point out that this is not, you know, even removing the time complexity and the, the large complex organizations, the legacy data, even if you remove that, this is still not an easy thing to do. Moving, you know, deciding where you're doing work instructions, moving that data from CAD into PLM, into MES, into ERP. Like that, that integration piece is not easy, even if you're fully model-based. Yeah. Oh, the, if, you, if you're trying to accomplish a digital transformation at an enterprise on the scale of a, a Lockheed Martin, an RTX, a Northrop Grumman, a Boeing, the number of variables and complexities is, it, it's, it's just mind-numbing. It's unbelievable. It is so complex. 
That's the, uh, if there's a, a story of hope in all of this, right, for our listeners, that's the one though, right? If if those companies are moving towards a model-based enterprise and see the value in it and the need to do it, and they're having some success doing it, even if it's slow and even if it's program by program, but if they're getting there, I, I think that's a ray of hope for a lot of organizations who maybe have more of a clean sheet situation um, that you can get there. There's still variables, still complexities, but you can get there. Yeah. I, you know, we call it transformation, but I think in reality, in most cases, it's going to be three yards in a cloud of dust and another three yards in a cloud of dust. And, you know, you just keep making first downs and it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be spectacular. It's just going to have to be constant progress. I like that topic that, that we were talking about a second ago. I want to come back to it. Um, I've got some opinions on it, as I know our viewers or listeners will be surprised to hear um, about where you do things. I think you brought up a good point, Jeff, that when you're planning an activity like this and trying to get to model-based enterprise, you have to think about the architecture of your IT systems. What tool or system will I use for what capability? And what's my process? So you're going to be re-engineering your process. If you're really trying to do digital transformation, not just digitize, but really go digital, you're going to be thinking about, okay, I need a 3D-based work instruction, right? Okay, what's my tool for that? You know, is it Arbor Text from PTC? Is it 3D Via from Dassault? Is it a built-in tool that is part of an MES platform or part of a PLM platform? Or, you know, but what is it? Because you might be able to shop and get it a number of places. So you have to think about that architecture and you have to keep in mind some of these other concerns we're raising about flexibility over time. And all right, what if I have this sort of heterogeneous operations where one order coming through needs to use the MES to do it, but the next order coming through, it'll already be done for it from some point tool I bought or, you know, but how does all that work together in that blend for the enterprise? But regardless of how you figure that out, it's, it's important to address those technical issues and have technical solutions, but to think about how does it all fit in the overall architecture, right? I think the, the point you were bringing up about legacy and how it gets us into this tool and process discussion is important. It's just another constraint you have to have in mind when you're doing it. And I want to come back to a thing you mentioned about like uh, where you do process planning. I, I'm with you. I think that PLM tools are getting better at it. Some of them are, are pretty good at it. But f- for me, we, we have to keep our eyes on what's the right place for the process we're trying to put in place. What's the right place to do it? Because you might have multiple options. You got to make some decisions. Um, hopefully, they're fact-based decisions on your requirements of your process and your organization. But you might do it different places. I don't think there's a right answer and if there is, it changes every day, right? With yeah. new tech, so there's not one right answer, right? Now, add a, so so. What you're describing is a, a rational decision making process that the enterprise should go through, and you're absolutely right. Now, sprinkle in there, uh, <laughs> sprinkle in there the human factor that we talked about in the first podcast. Okay, the, the religious camps mm-hmm. that, that prop up you know, pop up around specific solutions or the philosophical debates about, uh, you know, whether an all-in-one or a best-in-class architecture is best. Uh, And it kind of, you know, it really throws a wrench in, you know, when you're trying to have a a dispassionate decision-making process that is (laughs) fact-based. Well, you know- We're back to people again. So, another. I don't know why, but it reminds me. You know, I'm, a, I'm a beekeeper as well, by the way. So I'm a very bad beekeeper. I'm a, Jeff, a all rena- the things a we're learning. A true Renaissance man. So, and I'm really bad at it. However, the, <laughs> it just reminds me of. So, it's not something you want to be bad at, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, when I pick up a new nuke, a nucleus, a new bee nucleus, or a nuke, as we call it in the biz, beekeeping biz. Um, you know, I go, I go up, I pick it up from my source, you know, and they, they put them in these little crates and it's all closed up and sealed, right? Theoretically, because I'm putting it in the back of my Tahoe, you know, so the cargo area is open to me in the driver's seat. So, you know, I, I, uh, I, I bring my bee bonnet, but I don't wear it. 
and uh, they're all in the back, and I just hope they stay asleep in their in their little nuke crates. But if I'm flying down the road and I'm in an unfamiliar area, I'm trying to read my GPS to get home, uh, and at the same time, if if you know, if if a nuke is not secure, now I'm trying to do rational things like figure out where my next turn is while I've got killer bees swarming around my head you know, and I'm swatting them. <laughs> That, that's kind of, I don't know why, but that came to mind, Jonathan, when you're describing uh, this very, you know, rational, stepwise thought process you need to go through. It's it's based on facts. Uh, that's all great. Now, sprinkle in some killer bees, you know, the human element. <laughs> right, the human element, yeah. I'm just thinking about the great... Uh... So, if you just secure all of your engineers in the back of the car in yeah. a crate, <laughs> make the decisions, and then you can go. Tie everybody down and all, all, all the things. I, I think this is great because I'm thinking about that sound bite, you know, taken out of context is great, right? Because Jeff's talking about securing the nuke in the back and he, he used to work for Lockheed Martin. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Different kind of nuke. Oh, wait, we're talking about bees. Never mind. Right. <laughs> it would be hard enough and complex enough uh, if, it, if it were not for the people factor, but there is always the people factor, and there has to be. It's a human enterprise. The um, I, I'm curious from your experience, Jeff, um, you know, staying on the technical piece for a minute, what did you see maybe as the greatest challenges or successes or, or you know, just from your memory related to some of that systems integration work? Like, when did that work well, or what were the things that really got in the way when you you did have a decision, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to move to that, or we're going to implement this model-based uh, process using these new tools. When it came to tying systems or tools together, things that that are memorable in your mind about that? Well, as a matter of fact, the, the case that comes to mind um, is related to what we were just talking about um, a little while ago, and that is process planning. You know, uh, I remember... Uh, a situation we had wherein, um, you know, we had already implemented um, a manufacturing execution system that included a process planning capability, and that was in use uh, for that purpose. So, you know, we did the process planning on the initial programs in the MES, which, of course, fed the execution side of the same MES, all that was natively integrated and seamless. And then as we spread deployment of that MES to more programs, that included um, a couple of programs that uh, were brand new clean sheet uh, programs that were trying to be model-based from the start, as they should. And they wanted to do their process planning uh, in the PLM. And, um, but we had to feed, uh, that process planning, the inbound, the routings, the work instructions, all to the same, to the same MES that all other programs were using, uh, right. without using the process planning capability built into the MES. Uh, so we had to integrate, um, uh, uh, it sounds so, uh, just to say integrate PLM and MES in one breath like that sounds like, oh, okay, well, but it's... Yeah, it's just a thing you do yeah, on a like Tuesday, just, right? Yeah. Stitch but them you, together, it's fine. But integration consists of integration points, right? So you had to know, okay, what are all of the data elements that we need to pass from PLM to MES in what format? Um, so there's a pitch and a catch involved in every, every um, data exchange like that. Um, so that was pretty, and, and, and a sequence, right? A, yeah. An event or a sequence or a behavior. It's like, yeah, there's a lot to that. Yeah. Um, so that was very technically challenging. Um, you, you know, identifying the data that had to make its way over was actually not that hard. Um, but what you find is that, uh, interfaces are hard, you know, particularly when you're making them yourself. Yeah. And even when, you know, some of it we did ourselves, some of it we farmed out uh, to a third party, the interface work that is. Uh, in all cases, we had issues. 
uh, because uh, I know this will shock you, but we were under the gun, right? We're, we're supposed to do this really, really quickly. Everybody's in a huge hurry. Right. Like you're not doing it fast enough to satisfy anybody, and you're supposed to do it on the cheap. And, mm-hmm. you know, the results looked like it. You know, I'm reminded I'm reminded of, <laughs> I'm reminded of uh, a saying that our stress analysis guys used to have um, earlier in my career where they would say, you know what, you can have it, uh, you know, light, right, or overnight. Pick any two out of three. You know, you want this boat to be <laughs> light and right? Fast, cheaper quality. Yeah. If you want it to be light and right, it ain't going to be overnight. If you want it overnight <laughs> and light, it's not going to be right. You know, just pick two out of them. You can have them all. So we kind of face the same conundrum and, you know, you're under the gun, uh, making these interfaces and, you know, we got it done, but oh my gosh, the challenges along the way Uh, and the, and the system performance, you know, and, and even, you know, some data would, uh, was just in incompatible formats between the two systems, you know, and I had to go through some kind of transformation uh, just to be. Mm -hmm. Um, So it, it, uh, you know, we, we did it, we managed it, but it was painful. Yeah, that, that piece you mentioned a second ago reminds me of something that comes up for us a lot, right, is you've got to understand the nature of the data you're dealing with, right? And it might be like, oh, I, I get it. I get what process planning is made up of. But then you've got to understand how each of the systems represents it and what interfaces they have available to get to it. And, you know, a process plan looks different from an MBOM. It looks different from a work instruction. And it's like every one of those has got their own kind of unique characteristics you have to pay attention to. And if you don't understand it, you're probably going to goober it up. (laughs) Well, and not to mention the fact that, you know, Jeff mentioned that, you know, integrations, interfaces, they're hard. But a lot of times they are often left to the very end. It's like, okay, well, yeah, we'll just go ahead and we'll pass this from from here to there. Yeah, that'll be easy. (laughs) Right, exactly. It's it's just data. But uh, you know, so that there's a time element to that too, but but you're right. It's it's the time, the understand and it's the understanding of the data. Mm-hmm. It's the planning ahead of time. Yeah. Well, so what was your takeaway from all that, Jeff? Was it, you know, give yourself the right amount of time to do it or, you know, is there anything that you think makes that smoother that you would advise our listeners on when they're thinking about that kind of thing? Yeah, do a bit of a po- postmortem for you, for us if you will. Yeah, so now, um, some number of years later, you know, if we had it to do over again, uh, as it happens, you know, you know, technology continues to advance just in the, in the last few years since the events I described to today. Um, additional offerings are on the market that could have made our jobs a lot easier. You know, there are third-party off-the-shelf integrations between uh, PLM and MES. Razorleaf is is one example. Okay, Razorleaf offers just such an out-of-the-box integration, and there are others, um, um, you know, other similar offerings out there from other third parties where the, uh, you know, the enterprise that's trying to undergo the transformation that needs an interface doesn't necessarily have to either create it on their own or even re- rely on a third party to start it from scratch, there are third party offerings that are certified to work with major software tools uh, right off the shelf. So you can just buy it off the shelf and uh, implement it. And that's, you know, that's, that's the way I would go today. Right. If somebody's offering a head start, take it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Well, I want to uh, be cognizant of our listeners' time, and we've, we've you know, we're, we're about at our at our limits here. Um, if anybody has, first off, I want to thank uh, my co-host Jonathan and Jeff, especially. No offense, yes, Jonathan, but you're uh, here a thank lot. Thank you, Jeff. No, I'm here a lot. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff has a lot more interesting things to say. <laughs> He's got a lot of real world experience that I think um, really brings it home to a lot of our listeners. So I want to thank you for taking time to join us, not just once, but twice. Um, And encourage our listeners, if this is the first time you've seen Jeff, 
go back and find our first podcast on some of the challenges with establishing a model-based enterprise, where we focus on a little bit more on the people side of things. Today, we focused on the process and technology side. Um, I thought that one of the things most interesting to me was talking about the time element. Integration is hard. Um, tools move on. They, they do improve, but you know the, the additional time element of the complexity and the, the size of the organization makes what is a tough challenge even tougher. But to Jonathan's point earlier, if Lockheed Martin and the size of the programs and the length of time that they need to work with the data, if they can do it, pretty sure everybody else can do it too. So um, anybody, I want to encourage any of our listeners, if there's anything you have questions about or want to connect with us about, anything you want, you didn't hear today answered, but you, you'd like us to talk about, please let us know. Be part of the conversation. And until next time, stay sharp. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, family. Thank you for being here and listening to this episode of Stay Sharp with Razorleaf. If you have any questions about model-based strategies and approaches, we'd love to chat with you about that. So please leave a comment on our post or send us an email at podcast at razorleaf.com. We appreciate all the feedback we receive from our listeners. So don't be shy and make sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform or on our YouTube channel. Until next time, stay sharp.